Thanks, team. Appreciate you guys. You guys can go ahead and be seated. We'll dismiss our kids for Sunday school. Meet your teachers in the back. Yeah, I thought we'd play a little game here quick, because that's what you do at the beginning of a sermon, right? Just play a game. Uh, and also, what you do before a sermon is lie. So we're going to play two truths and a lie. Or was it two lies and a truth, right? Isn't it two lies and a truth? I can't remember. That's how we're going to play it. Two lies and a truth. So uh, here's my here's my three statements. See if you can figure out which one is is the lie. Um, one, uh, I I forgot my notes again, which is embarrassing. Two, um, uh, I just recently graduated from high school, also, and uh, <laughs> three, our softball team won by 12 points on Friday night. You might say talking about a softball team is a weird way to start a sermon, but uh, here's my connection. We're talking about the miracles of Jesus, <laughs> and if you know anything about our softball team, it is a miracle that we won by 12 points. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that is more than all of our margins of victory in history combined. I, I'm not lying. You'd laugh. I'm not lying. Anyway, yes, slow clap on that one. Appreciate that. So uh, we are in uh, Mark chapter 6 uh, on page 841. You can grab your pew Bible. I really encourage you, we say this all the time, I encourage you to have a Bible open in front of you. Uh, digital copy is fine, but we really encourage having a physical copy. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons. I've mentioned them a whole bunch of times, so I will forego it now. But uh, Mark chapter 6, one of the things we like to remember around here is that none of us have all the answers, uh, and we appreciate that, and we celebrate that for this reason. Uh, these are not the words of eternal life, but these are the words of eternal life. And so uh, I'm actually going to have you stand again, just to make sure you're not sleepy and you're paying attention. So I'm going to have you stand, uh, have your Bible open in front of you. I'm going to pray, and then we're going we're gonna to dive in here. Father... Thank you that you have given us the words of life. You say that uh, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you say that this is breathed out of the mouth of God. And you say that this is useful for God's people, for teaching and rebuke and training and, and, and correction. And so, Father, today we admit that we don't have all the answers, that we, uh, that what I'm going to say in my own strength is not going to change anybody's life, God, but you use these words to change lives and hearts and minds and behavior because you are a God who's all about recreating, making us new creations. And so, Father, we need you to do that now in these moments as we, as your people, gather around your word for your glory, and we ask it all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'm not a foodie. Some of you are. Uh, I'm not a foodie, at least in the truest sense of the word. I'm more of an eaty than a foodie. I don't know if that's a thing. I just made it up. So you just have to forgive me. If you're a, a real foodie, the foodies in this room are like, get this guy out of here. You are what's wrong with the people in the world, right? Anyway, even if you're not a foodie, everybody has a food story they like to tell. Uh, on our one year, one of the ones I like to tell, on our one year anniversary, uh, I was a pastoral intern at a, a church in upstate New York. And what that means when you're a pastoral intern is that you have just enough money to have a really nice dinner out in your own kitchen. And so I think I made some kind of poorly constructed chicken cordon bleu, and Amy made this beautiful uh, angel food cake, and she makes this awesome like chocolate whipped cream uh, frosting. It's just perfect. I love it. It's awesome. And uh, so anyway, she we had splurged, right, to buy like the good ingredient, ingredients and she made this cake, and uh, but the problem is we live in this little apartment. There's no room for it in the refrigerator, but no problem. It's upstate New York, right? It's plenty of cold outside in the late fall, and so we 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 take the cake outside. It's on the beautiful little platter. We you know we read it a bedtime story. We tuck it in, you know, shut the door. Dinner's over. We clean up the dishes. We go out, get out the plates for des uh, dessert, right? We open the door, and I kid you not, man, <laughs> there's this beautiful white. Uh, platter, and there's this one black dog hair right in the middle of the platter, and that is the only thing on the white platter left. And I, <laughs> I can still hear that dog stifling a laugh from around the corner at me 
oh my gosh, it's one of those stories that you're like, this is going to be funny later. <laughs> but right now, I'm going to kill that dog. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, Jesus has his own food story to tell. And uh, that's the scene that Mark is inviting us into next. It's the scene of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's one of the more recognizable stories from Jesus' public ministry. Uh, there are several unique details here, though, that make this particular scene compelling uh, in a unique way. However, I don't think the details are going to be nearly as compelling unless we know about them. So the first thing I want to do is uh, just start at the beginning with kind of these things that help us get set the stage and understand what's going on. And, and we'll just call that the beginning as we kind of introduce, introduce ourselves to the details. So the beginning. Then we'll work our way through the body of the story. That is the narrative itself, the story, the body, uh, as it unfolds. And then before we finish, I don't want to just finish the story and say, isn't that interesting? Uh, before we finish, I want to zoom out a little bit, or quite a bit actually, and make sure we're still holding in view the big picture. We said all of chapter 6 is meant to be seen as one larger story, that this one larger tapestry displaying Jesus' worth which is certainly significant, but there are other big picture connections that are being made uh, all over the Bible in this one story. So we'll take a few minutes to gaze at the beauty and unity of the big picture as well. So if you kind of like to keep notes or whatever, that's kind of my plan. We've got the beginning and then the body and then the big picture. That's where we're headed. From the beginning, uh, it's, it's helpful to recognize there are several things that make this scene unique, like I said. So let me just kind of go through some of those and we'll jump into the narrative. Uh, other than the resurrection itself, Julie alluded to this actually, this is the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. There's lots of miracles across those four Gospels, but other than Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, this is the only miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is interesting. And if nothing else, it tells us from the very beginning that this particular scene is unique. There's something going on here. There's some reason all four authors want to make sure we hear this story. Another unique feature is that the author doesn't focus on the reaction of the crowds. Uh, you'll notice that in most of the stories, especially when there are miracles happening, there's a focus on or, or we're told how the crowds respond to the experience that they've just gone through. A couple of examples uh, the crowds that try to push Jesus off a cliff at the beginning of chapter 6, right? After he gives this astounding message in the synagogue. Or at the beginning of chapter 5 uh, with Graveyard Gary. That's what we've affectionately called this guy. And, and the townspeople, right? They ask him to leave, like, get out of our town. That's kind of how the, the scene uh, ends. But this time it's different. There's really not, even though this is an absolutely astounding experience, it must have been. Have you ever thought about, like, how does Jesus in a short amount of time get enough food to thousands of people? I mean, are fish just flying out of his hands? I don't know. It doesn't tell us, but astounding experience. And yet there's no, uh, there's no time given to the crowd's response. A third unique feature is that the disciples are back from their mission trip that was started in verse 7. And like any missions team, especially if you've picked one up from the airport or something, they have stories to tell. They're exhausted. And this means they need some downtime with Jesus to kind of debrief and, and process what they've just experienced. But verse 31 says they don't even have the time for meals together. They don't have, even have the luxury to eat in peace. And so they're like desperately needing this downtime. And lastly, the last detail I'll mention, I can't help but notice that Mark, for some reason, we'll get to why, but for some reason, he really wants us to know that this next scene happens in what he calls a desolate place. Uh, you probably know that uh, when things are repeated in literature, it generally means that there's something significant, there's something being emphasized, and that's especially true in the Bible. And so it's no coincidence that in verse 31, Jesus wants to get away to, quote, a desolate place. And then in verse 32, Mark describes the place that they go as, quote, a desolate place. And later in verse 35, the disciples describe the place that they find themselves as a desolate place. That's going to matter when we zoom out to see the big picture. But for the moment, we're just going to tuck that detail kind of away in our brains for the moment. 
Those are some of the beginning details that shape what happens next, that kind of help set the stage for where we're headed next as we get into the body of the story. So the disciples are back. Everybody's tired. They're trying to find these few quiet moments in the wilderness, but verse 33 says that's just not happening. So Jesus and his disciples, as they've done recently in this season of ministry, they jump in this boat and they're going to go find some peace and quiet. They're going to go somewhere else on around this lake to kind of be by themselves. Uh, I don't know if you've if you have kids at home, if you've ever had this experience, or when you did have kids at home, if you ever gotten to the end of a long day and you just can't wait to fall in bed, like it's just been a long day and you're tired and work and the whole thing. And uh, so you tuck in all your kids, you go to the rooms, you tuck them in, you turn off the light, you say the prayers, you read the story, you do all the stuff and you get everybody in bed and you go to the last room, the last light comes off and you get, finally I get to fall in bed and you walk back to the bed and there sticking out from under the covers is a little set of eyes. (laughs) It's like, how did you get here? You're like Houdini. I just, I just, uh, this, this is like what Jesus is, what's happening to Jesus here. Uh, I love the response, though. You'll notice that um, he he says he wa- he needs this time away, and he gets in the boat, and they're sailing, and people find out about it, and they run and they beat him to where he's going. I love the response, though, in verse thirty-four. Unlike me, who's tempted to give a lecture or make a frustrated comment when this kind of things ha- when this that kind of thing happens, Jesus responds with compassion. I love this. This is. This is so classic Jesus. Verse 34, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And in my mind, if this is me, I'm saying, you've got to be kidding me. How did you, I was in a boat with these 12 guys rowing. How did you get here? Jesus doesn't say that. He has compassion on them. Because, here's why. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And who is Jesus? He's He's the great shepherd. He's the greatest shepherd. And so what does he do? He starts to love these sheep. He begins to teach them many things. Uh, There's a lot that's about to happen. But I want to pause and say something we've said many times before. It's so essential that Mark keeps bringing it up. Compassion is who Jesus is, not just what he displays. Sometimes we have a hard time internalizing that because... It's so different than our natural tendencies. But Jesus, it's not as if for a season Jesus displays this remarkable compassion and mercy. Jesus can't be any other way. Compassion is who He is. And that's, that's important for us specifically because it means a whole bunch of things. One of the things it means He's not a dictator waiting to pounce as soon as we step out of line. I knew you were going to screw up and I was waiting the whole time. That's not his attitude. He's not a sarcastic manager just waiting for our next mistake. He is compassion. He is patience. He is grace. We like to say around here, we like to put it this way, his mercy is bigger than our mess. It's bigger than any amount of mess that we can bring to the table. And one of the implications of this reality is that God's love most clearly seen in Jesus, it's not dependent. God's love is not dependent. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but I I think you'll want to. So let me say it again. There's nothing you can do today to make God love you less. No failure you experience today or yesterday or tomorrow will result in God loving you less. Nothing. Because the basis of His love for us is not our ability to produce or perform. And likewise, there's nothing I could do today to make Him love me more. Whether I go to church or, or help someone or refrain from anger or avoid, avoid certain websites, those things are all wise and commendable and fruitful, but none of them is going to make God love me more because He already loves us more. His love is perfect and it's complete. It's full, it's, and it's independent. Compassion is not just what Jesus possesses, it's who He is. And in this scene, like so many others, that compassion expresses itself through speaking the Gospel's truths. Verse 34, He began to teach them many things. In fact, uh, Mark is not exaggerating here, He began to teach them many things, in fact, so many things, that the whole day goes by. 
And you'll notice as the shadows begin to grow across the wilderness, the interns who are fresh off of a one-week-long professional career, uh, they have some advice, some suggestions for the teacher. Uh, and, and here's their suggestion. He's, Jesus has just shown compassion on these people who are like sheep without a shepherd. And the interns want to send the people away so they can take care of their own problems because this is kind of getting annoying. And I'm tired. Oh yeah, and I still haven't had anything to eat, Jesus. This is the disciples' suggestion. Jesus has his own suggestion in verse 37, though, you'll notice. Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. He tells the disciples, you want me to send them away? I've got a better idea. You give them something to eat. The disciples have to be thinking at this point, have you seen any food halls around Jesus? Like <laughs> The desolate place, remember? That's where we're at. And besides, they mention this in verse 37, so it's certainly not a stretch to think they're think, to say they're thinking it. Uh, to feed all these people would cost an average man eight months' salary. And so really, honestly, what do you expect us to do? Verse 38 is the first indication we're given that Jesus has a plan, that he's up to something. As you know, here's why I say it's our, it's our first indication as you know, Jesus doesn't ask questions because he needs to know something. He asks questions because we need to know something. So he asked the disciples, well, how many loaves do you have? How many snacks did you bring? The disciples don't have anything, and I think they could say, well, you're the one who told us not to bring anything on the mission trip, so it's not my fault, Jesus, right? They don't have anything to, to give. So they go out and they survey the crowds to see if anybody has any food. One of the astounding things I find is there's 5,000 families represented here, and one mom out of 5,000 thought to pack snacks. It's just different than our house. If you go five minutes without snacks, we're all going to starve to death. Anyway, they go out, they survey the crowd, and John chapter 6 in his telling of the story tells us there's one little boy with five loaves, and two fish. Now, this is not explicitly in the text. It is in a way, but uh, just so that you know, when we hear loaves, we think of like right in a plastic bag, like a sliced loaf of bread, like sunbeam bread, right? This is not, this is not, he's not carrying around five grocery bags full of, right? So this really what it is, is uh, most accurately for us to use like just our common language. He has five biscuits, basically. It's like a little personal loaf of bread, like something you could throw in a backpack and take with you, and you could eat kind of along the way. So he has five biscuits and two sardines. That's basically what he has, okay? And which makes what's about to happen even more compelling. What we're about to see is that Jesus can do anything with nothing. Just like when he spoke the world into existence, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Just like when he takes a barren Abraham and Sarah and he creates a nation. It's the same thing he does when he takes a slave turned prisoner and uses him to rescue God's people from a worldwide famine. It's the same thing that he does when he takes a group of oppressed slaves from Egypt and gives them a nation using nothing more than a stuttering prophet and his staff. And I don't mean like his secretary and his treasure, like an actual staff, right? Or when he takes a shepherd boy and knocks off a giant Philistine war hero, or a single faithful prophet and defeats 450 thundering prophets on Baal, of Baal on top of Mount Carmel. God is all about being able to do anything with nothing. Which is really good news for us. Let me just rehearse really quickly how this is good news, how this applies. This is good news for parents because sometimes it feels like nothing is all that's left in the relationship with your adult children. Sometimes nothing is just exactly how much it feels like your teenager cares about your rules and your relationship. This is, this is really good news for husbands and wives who feel like nothing is all they have left in common. This is really good news for neighbors and co-workers who want to see the people that they care about and live around be satisfied in Jesus, but the affections for Christ that those people have are essentially non-existent. There, there's nothing there. 
the resounding message of what's about to happen is don't lose heart. We don't have to give up. Don't get lost in the vortex of discouragement because our Savior is in the business of doing everything we need even when nothing is all we have left. This is why 1 Peter says we have a living hope. Because our hope rests securely in a living, risen Savior who turns, who turns death into life, who turns discouragement into delight, who makes even poverty a reason to praise, and who can turn a couple little fish into a massive feast. God can do anything with nothing. And you know who knows, who knows that? Jesus knows that. And so Jesus gets everybody organized and seated. He divides them up into these groups and they sit down. And that's, if you've ever led people, like this is the real miracle, right? That 5,000 families can be organized. And um, so he gets them all organized. He takes the little boy's snack. He prays. He begins to have the disciples distribute the food. And verse 42 tells the whole story. They ate and they were satisfied. They ate all 5,000 men, which is shorthand of the day to say there were 5,000 families represented. Uh, it doesn't tell us specifically what the true population was. Uh, if we use FCC ratios here, there were like 25 or 30,000 people there. Uh, and so this is, this is a miracle of these massive proportions. They all ate, and this is probably the most important word in the whole story, they were all satisfied which brings us to the big idea of this scene, our big idea for this story. And that's simply that Jesus is enough. That's a, that's a simple thought. That's an accessible thought. But I, I suggest to you that it's a hugely significant thought. That it's a paradigm-shifting reality. It's not just an idea. It's a reality. That Jesus is enough. Jesus was enough for every single person in the crowd that day, even the doubting disciples who thought they knew better. What does verse 43 say? How much food was left over? What does it say? Twelve baskets. And how many disciples are there? There's twelve. And who was wondering how on earth all these people were ever going to be fed? The disciples. And to make this even clearer, Mark uses a really specific word here. This is the only place in the New Testament that this particular Greek word is used in our Bibles is just simply translated as basket, probably in most of your in your Bibles. It's always that word has always made me picture like these huge like laundry, like laundry hamper size baskets. Like they're just they're not they're just cleaning up after messy crowds who just left stuff everywhere. But that's not what's really happening. The word it technically translated would be hand basket, but it's their lunchbox. He packs 12 lunch boxes of, of food that's left over. And this is just, this is precise providence. Jesus' providence is so precise, so intentional, so trustworthy and satisfying that the same disciples who were so worried about feeding all the people and how much money it would cost them, where the food would come from, they wind up with just enough food to fill their lunchbox. The crowds went away satisfied and the disciples walk away with a personal reminder that Jesus is enough. He's enough. We can trust Him. He can do anything we need even when we have nothing left. And that reality has even greater clarity, I think, when, when we keep the big picture in view as we keep saying, this is not just an isolated story in, in, an, in a random anthology of interesting fables. This is intentionally included by Mark at this specific time in the middle of chapter 6. And it's helping us to see, yes, it's teaching us things in this scene, but it's helping us to see bigger realities and bigger truths. Jesus is trustworthy even when your hometown turns on you. Jesus is trustworthy even when you're out on your own. Even when the king wants you, 
dead. Even when you're in the middle of the wilderness and there's nothing left to eat, even in the middle of a lake like we're going to see next week, or when you're in desperate need of healing and compassion like the crowds in verse 56, Jesus is enough in all of those circumstances. And there's an even greater degree of clarity if we zoom out further to hold in view the the real big picture, which is where we'll finish. What I find is that historically, I've been so focused on the details of stories like this. And and I've been preoccupied, I think, with the, I've, I've never been able to figure out how do you get that much food to that many people in that short of a time? It was already evening. And like, I just get so fixated. And I think that's an interesting question. And there's probably great theories out there, those kind of things. But I don't think that's the point of the story. And so I think we miss these big picture realities if we zoom so far in, all we can see are the tiny details. The details are good, but the broad brush strokes have a story to tell as well. So that's where I want to finish with the big picture, broad brush strokes. Several significant connections are being made by Mark here as this narrative unfolds, if we have eyes to see it. I'll mention three of them. First, Uh, I'm going to let you talk for a minute. Where does this scene unfold? Mark drew special attention to it early on in the story. Where are these crowds? They're at a desolate place, or we said another way to say that is they're in the wilderness, right? So they're in the wilderness, and what are they in need of? What is their problem? Yeah, they, they need a shepherd, but their most immediate pressing need is The food, right? They're hungry. That's their felt need. They're hungry. And who are these people? Are they Egyptians? Are they Americans? Are they Amalekites? Who who are these people? Uh, They're people from all over, but they're on this side of the lake. And so who are they primarily? They're Israelites, right? And so, and what does God do for them? Can you think of another story where there's a group of Israelites in the wilderness and they're hungry. And what does God do for them in that situation? He gives them manna, right? He provided this food. He proved that he was enough. He proved he was enough for his people no matter where they went or what problem they encountered. I don't know if anybody has ever told you this, but that story about manna in the wilderness in Exodus 16 is not really about a group of liberated slaves. And you can even think Titus 3.3 here. That'll blow your mind on a whole other level. It's not really about a group of liberated slaves who were hungry and then found some tasty bread on the ground. That story in Exodus 16, does anybody want to guess who the story was about? It's about Jesus. How do we know that it's about Jesus? This is the kind of question, when I started to see these things, I was asking all the time. How do I really know this one's about Jesus? I could just be making this up because now I'm seeing it everywhere. How do we know this story is about Jesus? He said so. Absolutely. Where does he say so? One place is John 5, 46. Another place would be Luke 24, 24. They tell us that this story is about Jesus. In John 5, 46, Jesus says specifically, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Moses wrote Exodus 16. So we know the story about God providing bread for a group of hungry Israelites in the wilderness was actually about Jesus. And we also know because just across the page in John 6.35, go ahead and look at John 6.35 with me. Jesus explicitly makes this connection. So he tells us this like all over in the Gospels. Uh, Luke 24 is one of the classic, it's the road to Emmaus, right? And these two disciples, they're walking with Jesus. They don't know it's him. And they say, there's this Jesus guy, he did all these crazy things. and, uh, And Jesus says, oh, really, tell me about him. And then he opens their minds and he tells them all these stories from the Old Testament. And he says, they were all about me the whole time. And then they realize it's Jesus. There's lots of other places. John chapter 6 and verse 35. In John's gospel, right after this episode with the crowds, the the feeding of the 5,000 as it were, right after that, the crowds show up again because they're looking for more free bread. And they say, ironically, 
<laughs> They've just been fed miraculously by Jesus. And here's the next demand they make. Show us a sign, essentially, that you're really the Son of God so that we might believe. As if he didn't just show them a sign, right? I mean, if you were like Taylor making this, you could say, hmm, I don't know, like maybe feed 5,000 people with you know five loaves and a two fish. But they say, show us a sign. And they're so dense, they actually say in verse 31 when they're asking for a sign, they say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And they're saying, give us a sign just like that. Jesus says in verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus responds, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's all about me. I, I, I'm the, I'm the one that God has sent and he's been preparing you to see for thousands of years that it was me all along. I am God's perfect provision. I am the true bread of life that the silly manna was pointing to all along. The difference is with me, you'll never be hungry again. How do we know that the people who ate the manna were still hungry? Because they went out the next day and did it again. And what is it called when you're not thirsty anymore and you're not hungry anymore? What is that called? It's being satisfied. Jesus is enough. The satisfaction that the crowds experience in verse 42 is merely, it's just, it's just a preview. It's just a, a quick picture. It's, a, it's just a foretaste of what walking with Jesus for all eternity is like. Our Savior has power over suffering and the grave. This is what our faith is about. Our faith is not about gaining a better life or a temporary moral makeover. It's about real satisfaction that lasts. I come back again and again and again to the way that David expresses this in Psalm 16. I've encouraged many of you to go there. So I've just, I want to finish here. Psalm 16, verses 8. 11. Here's how David expresses it. I have set the Lord always before me. He talks in other places about just that constant reviewing of God's promises and precepts. That's what he means when he says, I've set the Lord always before me. He's always in his Bible. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Because he's with me. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices and my flesh also dwells secure. Verse 10 says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forever. One more question, and then we'll be done until next week when we'll rejoin Jesus in the middle of a lake, in the middle of another difficult night on the water. Here's my question. What is fuller than full? Anything? Nothing. Nothing's fuller than full. And what's longer than forever? Nothing. Piper likes to say, nothing is fuller than full, and nothing is longer than forever. And so I will sum it up and just say, Jesus is enough. Even when Jesus is all you have, you have all you need. He's all we need. Father, thank you that we get to rehearse this again, that we get to soak in the good news of the gospel again. Father, as we move to a palpable reminder that you came to be enough for us, that you are the bread of life that you, you satisfy us and we won't hunger and we won't thirst. Father, I pray that you would be just opening our eyes. Lord, help us to make the connections that maybe we've not made historically. Help us to 
see and understand the things that maybe we've never seen in a way that's deep before. Help us to surrender our lives in a way to a degree that we have not yet. Father, my prayer as always is that, Father, if, if there's somebody here who does not exp- who has not experienced that, if who, who doesn't understand from experience that Jesus is enough, Father, I pray that you would be doing the work that only you can do. There's no amount of raising hands, coming forward, saying prayers that can save us. Only you can save us. And so, Father, would you, would you be doing your work? You say that nobody comes to the Father unless you draw him right there in John 6. And so we are trusting you. You are our provision. You are our hope. You are the promise that we're trusting in. You're the promised seed to crush the head of the slandering snake. You're the promised son that would come. You're the new and better prophet. You're the high priest without blemish. You're the sacrificial lamb. You're the scapegoat. You're the lion of Judah. You're the king whose throne never ends. Lord, thank you that we can rejoice in these realities. And Father, for those who say, I, I just don't I, don't, I don't, I have enough as it is. I don't, that a day is coming when we won't have enough. And so would we use these good times to prepare for the times that are stressful, that the struggle comes. And so, Father, we ask all these things in the good name of Jesus for the glory of His Son and the good of His people. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab your uh, communion elements with you. Uh, if you didn't grab one on the way in, you just kind of raise your hand and we'll make sure you, you get one. Uh, so this is an object lesson to remind us of uh, what we've just been talking about, and that is that Jesus is good enough. Uh, and if you've ever taken, I was not a, uh, an education major, but I've talked to lots of people who are in education, and one of the uh, principles that they'll talk about is a good teacher will give you an object lesson. Like they use all these like senses to teach and Jesus is this master teacher, and so uh, just as he's about to die, he brings the, his disciples, and it's like the night before he's betrayed, and he uses this, this bread and this wine to teach this lesson. And the lesson is that he's enough, and that we should remember him. As often as we gather together, that this is about him. It's not about us. It's not about uh, our music, our preference, our styles. It's about him. And so Uh, What we're saying by doing this, I encourage you to take this with us. If you are saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, that He is my righteousness, and that He is my only hope to ever be good enough. What we're saying is that no amount of of legislation, no administration, no, no education, no skill, no talent, no ability, no bank account, like nothing is going to save us ultimately. My kids, I said something the other day about you, uh, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. And they're like, what is a hearse and what is a U-Haul? So, so I'd explain that whole thing. And then the, like, the moment was passed and it's just dad rambling again, right? But, but like, that's what we're saying is you can't take any of it with you. Not even experience, not even a relationship apart from Christ. And so, so this is saying in a palpable, demonstrable way, Jesus is enough. We're saying we believe that he is our savior, that he is our hope, that he is our redeemer and our rescuer and our deliverer, and he's all we need. And so as we take these things, that's what we're saying. And if you want to say with us, proclaim, demonstrate with us publicly and say, I believe that Jesus is enough for me, then man, I I encourage you to take this with us. That's what we're communicating as we take these things together. You can take the little cracker thing in there. And Jesus broke the bread. This is so small, you'll lose it if you break it, so don't do that. But he took the bread, and it was to picture his body being broken for us. So we take in remembrance of him together.
He also took the cup. He passed it around. This was pre-COVID. And uh, to everybody. And uh, they drank. And he said, this is symbolizing. This is a picture of my blood that was shed for you. And, and the implication of that is that you're not good enough on your own. And, and the cool thing is that it, there was so much symbolism attached to it because it's pass, part of the Passover supper that they would take to remember how, Jesus, how God came and rescued them from slavery in Egypt and how they took the blood and they put it over the, the doorposts and the whole thing. And so they were already remembering something and Jesus was saying, yes, you can remember God's faithfulness in the past, but remember my faithfulness to you now in the present. And so that's what we remember as we take together. We'll take. Thanks. Please stand with us.
Good morning, Faith Community Church. Let's slide over a little bit. Good. See, the camera has to be right in the middle here. <laughs> My name is Jeff DeBoy. I'm one of the elders here at Faith Community. Good morning. Uh, I have a guest with us for, for uh, our announcements this morning. This is the fantastic Amanda Cook. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Say hello. Hi. Oh, God. That was weak. <laughs> So we just want to welcome all, start by welcome all of our visitors today. If this is your first time here, we hope you were greeted warmly by our First Impressions team as you walked in. We, uh, we're glad you're here. We hope you come back. Uh, and a special message for our online viewers today. Hi out there, wave. Out there, out there. They see us. Not you, Seth. Us. <laughs> we, uh, we hope that you enjoyed the, the sermon today and the whole service today, really. And we miss you. So would you consider... Coming back here in the building and joining us in the next couple of weeks. We're still having the uh, television outside. If you want to just take the first step and sit outside, it's not that bad at 10 o'clock in the morning right there, is it? Not that bad. But come, come on, take the first step. Come on, join us back here in this building. We miss you. We want you back. And uh, we love you. So please consider that. So Amanda has a very specific task today, but not yet. So just stand by. You just stand by awkwardly. All right. Our first, uh, our first announcement, Evan. All right, the prime timers are getting together next Friday night. No, it's not next Friday night. It's the 17th. I'm sorry about that. Uh, from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. at Lorraine's Coffee House here in Garner, they're going to see a gospel bluegrass group. Information is in the e-bulletin. The, the prime timers are, oh, man, they're an awesome group of, of our folks here at Faith Community Church. They're a little more senior, and they're just so just wise and they're just they're just a, an important part of our of our team here at, at faith community we hope that you would join them uh on the 17th at lorraine's okay evan fantastic okay several women's events coming up here that we want to make you aware of the first one is a mom's and kids play date that will begin on june the 9th from 9 30 in the morning to 11 30 in the morning and run through september the first event will be at the home of Liz Smith. I don't see Liz here today. That's okay. It's open to moms and kids and any woman who would just like to come to fellowship. The first event, again, is at Liz's house. The e-bulletin has information about this. You can click on it. If you, ha if you want more information, uh, Liz's email, you just click on her name on the e-bulletin and you can send her an email. Evan, the fam fabulous Evan Burris up, in the, up in, the, in the nest there today, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies, coffee and tea. All right. Ladies Coffee and Tea event at the home of Pam Carson. This is next Saturday from 10 in the morning till noon. This will include some of our Afghan neighbors. Now, this will be the first time that these Afghan ladies will be in an American home. And will also be the first time they will be in the home of a believer. Ladies, special invitation to you. If you can make this event please do. Please, let's show the love of Faith Community Church to these Afghan women in a wonderfully secure area place like Pam Carson's home, a friendly place. Please come and, and share just some time, some of your time and your love with these Afghan ladies. See Pam for information. Uh, okay, Nails Night. Now, I could use this. But uh, it, it's not for it's not for guys. It's Nails Night with Tori Cease, uh, Tori Cease uh, here at the church on Monday, June the thirteenth at seven o'clock. Ladies, thirteen years and up, come on over for some fun and fellowship. You're not going to be here. Oh well, you'll be okay. Gotcha. Okay, fun and fellowship while learning some new nail techniques. You can email the office to RSVP. We do need an RSVP, ladies, so please, uh, please consider that. All right. Okay. Here's, here's where you come in. <laughs> it's a little blurry. <laughs> Thanks to Maurice Woodard, who sent us this, this picture. This is the final score from the men's softball game the other night. <laughs> We, we knew we needed several pieces of information to confirm that it was actually true for you, because you know our history. So we have a picture of the scoreboard. The other team had 13. 
We had 25. We played seven innings. That's why the seven is in the middle. And pastor, it's not we won by 12 points. We won by 12 <laughs> runs. This is the shortstop of my team, and he's using basketball terms for softball. Great, Scott. Remember, now, last week he played in all right? Yes, last week he, he, see, he, he busted my chops last week about saying playing and uh, throwing an audible instead of, instead of calling an audible. Yes, okay. Okay. So this is where Amanda comes in. I knew that you, you just need only, you know, just a picture wouldn't be enough. You needed a witness. <laughs> Were you at the game Friday night? Yeah. Did we win 25 to 13? Definitely. Did you, we all have popsicles after the game? Sure. <laughs> Is this the greatest group of softball talent ever assembled in any venue anywhere? Sure. <laughs> There's a dollar. Go get yourself a couple of ounces of gasoline. <laughs> Thank you. Amanda Cook. The games continue. Our, we play this Monday at 7, Monday at 7, and Thursday at 8. Come on out. It's a lot of fun. Thank you to our fans. Man, we had a lot of fans there uh, this week, and it's just a fun time of fellowship. Win or lose, we're out there to have fun. So come on out and join us. Uh, if you need the directions, they're in the e-bulletin, Evan. Okay, we are still in need of at least two teachers and two assistants for the children's ministry. If Please, if the Lord has put this on your heart at all, just to even ask for more information about it, it's not rocket science. Please, we will, we will help you through this and, and give you the tools and the support necessary to spend an hour with our kids uh, on Sunday mornings. You don't have to commit to it for five years. We, we will not sign you up for anything like that. But we would love to have at least four more people come forward to help out with the children's ministry. We have a wonderful group of kids in this church, as you all know, and uh, we need your help. Would you prayerfully consider that? Evan? Prayer Wednesday is coming up this Wednesday. We hope you will join us. We pray here every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. We hope you will join us this Wednesday. It really is a sweet time. Um, I, I don't know how to explain it other than it's just a sweet time. We, we have a group of people in here, and we just we just bring up uh, some topics, and we just pray for them, and we bear each other's burdens for things that are going on in our own lives. Please consider joining us this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We are done. I'm telling you. In an hour, we are done. So we will not hold you here all night. Please join us. And then I got one more real quick. Car Care Saturday is coming back for June. We're going to be here uh, at Dawson and, and Nina's house June the 18th. That's a, that's Father's Day weekend, the 18th, from 9 to noonish. So if you have not let us know, if you're single or widow and you have not let us know that you need car maintenance, please let me know after the service. Or you can go to the e-bulletin. There'll be something in next Thursday's e-bulletin about it. You can click. Okay? Let me pray for us. Father God, how grateful we are that you are enough, Lord, that we don't need to, to search anywhere else. Father, have us be in your word more to learn more about you, to find out why you're enough, to find out how you are enough, to find out the many ways that you are enough. Thank you, Father, for what you do for us. May you be enough for us today and this coming week, Lord, for always through eternity. We're just so grateful for this time you've given us. I ask you to bless us as we go on our way. And we ask these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. I've seen you move. You move the mountain.